Okay, um, today we're going to talk about covalent bonding. We're going to talk about how to draw a Lewis structure and from that how to predict shape, bond angle, and polarity and maybe even predict hybridization. We may not be able to, in fact I'm certain we won't be able to lecture on what hybridization is, but we should be able to, uh, to describe the hybridization about the central atom of a molecule. So let's take a look at a very simple molecule. Uh, we're going to talk first of all about covalent bonding and we know that covalent bonding results upon the sharing of a pair of electrons. And so the simplest uh, covalent compound I could imagine is hydrogen H2. If you were to draw the Lewis structure for, hydrogen a for a hydrogen atom, there's a, of course a symbol for hydrogen with one dot. And if we have two of them, because the formula is H2, you can see they each have one dot. If we bring those close enough to each other, those uh, 1s orbitals can overlap and they can share a pair of electrons. And that's the covalent bond. Now the structure that I just have drawn up here is called the Lewis structure and is a skill we will shortly master. Once again, the force that holds the molecule together is the attraction that each nucleus has for the electrons being shared. This simultaneous attraction for electrons between two nuclei is the rationale behind covalent bonding. Now let's do another pretty simple Lewis structure. Let's take hydrogen fluoride. The Lewis structure for hydrogen is, we just saw, is hydrogen with one dot, one electron, and fluorine has seven dots, seven valence electrons about the uh, nucleus of the fluorine atom. I'm going to put uh, six of those as three pairs on three of the four sides of my fluorine and then the other one I'm going to put as an odd electron. And you can see once again that these orbitals get close enough they can overlap each other and we end up with a shared pair of electrons. And you'll notice that hydrogen is satisfied because it has two electrons about it some of the time which is the noble gas configuration of helium and fluorine has what we call an octet. It has four pairs around it some of the time, in fact most of the time, which is a stable noble gas configuration. And of course we say there's something seemingly magical about that number eight. Let's take a look at another pretty simple Lewis structure. I'm going to show you a bit of a different way to draw these. Um, let's take the number of chlorine atoms and we're going to multiply the number of chlorine atoms by the number of valence electrons each has. So chlorine being in group 17 has seven valence electrons. Um, it has a P2, or excuse me, S2P5 configuration which gives us seven valence times two chlorine atoms gives us a total of 14. Then we're going to draw the atoms next to each other, at least the element symbols next to each other. We'll put a pair between them. There's my covalent bond. And then we'll give each chlorine a full octet by drawing three more pair on the remaining three sides of each chlorine atom. We count up how many dots we've used. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, which is the number that we're allowed. And you can see that in this Lewis structure, each chlorine, for part of the time, has four pairs of electrons, or eight electrons in its valence. Uh, level. Let's do one for water quickly. Uh, water has two hydrogens, one valence apiece, and one oxygen with six valence for a total of eight valence. So I can have eight dots in my Lewis structure. Here, of course, we need to decide which atom goes in the center. Uh, we'll do the uh, the wrong one first, and it should make sense almost immediately. If I were to put H in the center and put an oxygen to the right and a hydrogen to the left and then put a pair between hydrogen and oxygen, there's no problem there. But then when I put a pair between hydrogen and hydrogen, this hydrogen now has four electrons or two pairs around it. Well, hydrogen only has one energy level. The maximum number of electrons it can have is one pair or two electrons. So let's put oxygen in the center put a hydrogen to the right and a hydrogen to the left. We'll put a pair between this oxy uh, oxygen and this hydrogen and oxygen and the other. So now oxygen has two pairs so far, or four valence electrons. We'll put a pair above and a pair below, and now the oxygen has four pair 
giving it a stable octet, and each hydrogen has one pair. And that is my Lewis structure for water. Notice I've used two, four, six, eight valence electrons, which was the number I was allowed. Now we're going to talk about polarity. Now, all bonds are considered to be polar bonds. Now, I didn't say all molecules are considered to be polar. I said all bonds are polar unless the two atoms joined are identical to each other. For instance, hydrogen to hydrogen would be a nonpolar bond. But if hydrogen is bonded to any other atom, it would be a polar bond. Now, the extent of the polarity depends upon the difference in electronegativities. For instance, uh, in hydrogen to hydrogen, there's no electronegativity difference because they're the same atom. And in hydrogen to carbon, there is an electronegativity difference of about 0.3 electronegativity units, which makes it slightly polar. In hydrogen to fluorine, however, that difference shoots up to 1.8, which makes it a strongly polar bond. So bonds are polar unless the atoms bonded to each other are identical. Now molecular polarity is something different. Diatomic molecules are polar if atoms differ. For instance, H to Cl is a polar molecule. So we have a polar bond and a polar molecule because that pair of electrons is not being shared equally. We have something called a dipole. So chlorine has a slightly higher electronegativity than does hydrogen. This side of the molecule has a slight negative charge, while this side would have a slight positive charge. So we have a positive and negative end, which makes it a polar molecule. It's binary, or diatomic, because there's two atoms. It's polar because those two atoms are different. Chlorine to chlorine, on the other hand, is nonpolar because, once again, that pair of electrons is being shared equally. So there's no dipole. Now, polyatomic molecules may have polar bonds, but the molecule may be nonpolar. That depends upon the geometry of the molecule itself. Now, if I were to quickly draw the Lewis structure for BEF2, it would look like this. And I know you're going to have an argument here in just a minute saying, Hummer, beryllium only has two pairs of electrons around it. Well, beryllium is one of our exceptions to the octet rule. It only needs two pairs. So this molecule is what we would call linear. Now there's a dipole uh, because fluorine has a higher electronegativity than beryllium. So this side would be positive and this side would be negative. But then there's a dipole in the opposite direction as well. And these dipoles act to cancel each other out. So there's no net dipole. Dipoles are vector quantities. So if I have one being pulled in this direction with a certain amount of force, and one 180 degrees from that being pulled in the opposite direction with that same force, those dipoles cancel. I like to think of a, a spaceship analogy, like we have uh, a spaceship here represented by the fluorine atom with its tractor beam attached to the beryllium atom, pulling it with all of its force in that direction towards the right. And then an exact replica of that spaceship pulling in the other direction uh, with the same amount of force. If that beryllium atom stays still, which it will, the dipoles cancel and it's nonpolar. If it moves, then it would be polar. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to redraw the Lewis structure for water here for you. And once again, a line like this can represent a shared pair or just a pair of electrons. So there's my Lewis structure for water. And you're going to find out in a minute that water's actually bent. It's not linear. So a better representation of the water molecule you'll find out shortly is this. And you can see if I have a spaceship pulling, well, we're just going to say in this direction, and in this direction, we'd have a net dipole somewhere in here. That oxygen would move, and therefore we'd have a polar molecule. So sometimes molecules can be polar um, if they have polar bonds. Sometimes molecules can be nonpolar, even though they have polar bonds. So let's spend some time talking about how to draw Lewis structures, how to predict electronic geometry, shape, bond angle, and polarity. We're going to start with ammonia. Let's go with the Lewis structure first. Nitrogen has five valence. Each hydrogen has one valence for a total of eight valence electrons. Now we're going to start by putting nitrogen in the center. We'll make that our central atom. And then I'm going to put a pair of electrons between nitrogen and a hydrogen on this side, 
and on the other side, and on the bottom. So now each hydrogen is satisfied because it has a pair of electrons. The nitrogen is not quite satisfied because it needs an octet. So far I've used two, four, six of my eight valence electrons. I'm going to put the remaining two on top. So this is the Lewis structure for ammonia. Now let's talk a little bit about electronic geometry. We are going to represent an electron pair uh, with this particular type of shape. This happens to be an sp3 hybrid orbital. It sort of kind of looks like a balloon. Now we have four of those attached to the central atom here, nitrogen. And so if I were to build that, they would not take on, let's see, a planar arrangement. Some people would like to think that they would form an X here. And in reality, they don't. These electron pairs are repelling each other. They want to be as far away from each other as possible. And when they do that, they take on this tetrahedral shape. We call this a tetrahedron. So the geometry of the electron pairs, not the molecule yet, the geometry of the electron pairs is called tetrahedral. Now the shape refers to the shape of the molecule. And here we need to consider now the atoms that are bonded. And so we have one, two, three of them that are bonding. One, two, and I'll put the third one up here and set it like this. And we end up with um, this particular structure. Now you'll notice it's not flat. It's not planar. We end up with these three hydrogens uh, on one plane and the nitrogen popping out above with this lone pair sticking out up here. We call this shape a trigonal pyramid. So trigonal pyramid. And the bond angle well, one would expect it to be 109.5. That is the angle between pairs in a perfect tetrahedron. However, non-bonding pairs take up a bit more space than bonding pairs. Now that has to do with the nuclei, uh, the two nuclei sharing that pair of electrons and sort of thinning out that hybrid orbital. Up here, uh, there's only one nucleus that's attracted to that pair. There's no nucleus up here pulling on the electron pairs, thinning that out. So this non-bonding pair occupies a bit more space than the bonding pairs, and so it pushes them down. In fact, for each non-bonding pair, it reduces the bond angle by about two degrees. Now, that's a little bit more than that, but we're gonna say about two degrees. So this angle here, we would like it to be 109.5, but it's actually closer to 107 degrees. It is not 90 degrees. I know it looks that way in the Lewis structure, but when you see this type of structure, you need to envision this type of model in your mind's eye, where you have a non-bonding pair above, these two hydrogens are poking back into the paper, and this one's poking out of the paper. I know when I draw it like this, it looks like a 90 degree angle, but it's not. Now, let's use our spaceship analogy and determine polarity. If I have three spaceships pulling on that nitrogen atom in the middle, and there's no spaceship over here on this side, wouldn't we get a movement? Wouldn't we get a dipole? Wouldn't they be able to tow it or pull it in this direction? Since that nitrogen is moving, the dipoles we can see do not cancel, so this would be a polar molecule. Okay? All right, let's do another one, and then we'll conclude part one, and uh, we'll do the rest of these as a part two. Well, let's do methane, CH4. Carbon has four valence. Each hydrogen has one valence. So we have a total of eight valence electrons again. Put carbon in the center, and we'll bond each hydrogen to that on each of the four sides. And so this is the Lewis structure for methane, CH4. Now the electronic geometry, once again, we're just looking at the electron pairs. We don't care if they're bonded at this point. We're just looking at those four pairs of electrons. And we know that four pairs as far away from each other as they can possibly be form a tetrahedron or a tetrahedral shape.
Now the molecular shape happens to be the same. All four pair are bonding. And so they're of course going to stay as far away from each other as they can still. And we end up with the shape of the molecule being tetrahedral. Now the bond angle, since all four pair are bonding and there are no non-bonding pairs to push the other ones down, would be a perfect 109.5 degrees. Once again, that's not 90, that's 109.5 degrees. The polarity? Well, let's look at our spaceship analogy here. Now we have four spaceships pulling on that carbon atom. Yeah, three are pulling this way, but one's pulling in the other. That thing's not going to move, is it? So the dipoles cancel. The vectors add up to zero. So even though the individual bonds are polar, the molecule is nonpolar. All right, that'll wrap up part one. We'll continue with oxygen and nitrogen with the next part.